Hi friends, and welcome back to Raft. Today we're going to talk about how the science of Raft makes zero sense. As some of you probably know, in addition to being a speedrunner and content creator, I study ecology. Ecology is basically what you get if you smack biology and environmental science together really hard, or technically it's the study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. I specifically study marine ecology, so ocean-based ecology. Basically, what I'm saying is I study nature, specifically ocean nature. And the nature of raft just doesn't line up. Before we get too much further, please note that this isn't a criticism of raft whatsoever. I love this game and the world it builds, so please don't take this as a real critique, just some scientist being annoyed that the exact thing I study isn't right. Also a heads up for anyone who is worried about spoilers, I will be talking about story locations both currently in the game and the ones we expect to come, so you may want to skip this video if you're concerned about that. I'd recommend this one instead. Anyways, let's get into why the science of Raft makes absolutely no sense. So canonically in the Raft story, the world is covered in water due to climate change, which we can assume that that means that all of the glaciers have melted, causing drastic sea level rise. Yeah, this is a very big problem for a number of reasons. Not only do we lose all of the very important species and habitats that live on the various glaciers throughout the world, but of course that also puts additional water into the ocean, causing that dreaded sea level rise. There's also a number of other issues that aren't pertinent to the game, like albedo loss and methane release, as well as the potential of deadly bacteria resurfacing, but like I said, those aren't exactly relevant to Raft, so we're gonna skip all of that. Now, we can safely assume that the game is set in the tropical or subtropical Caribbean due to the abundance of pineapples, watermelons, and palm trees on land, and the warm water coral reefs under the water. We can specify the Caribbean over the Pacific Ocean because of the fish species we get from our fishing rods. From the herring modeled after Atlantic herring and the mackerel modeled after Atlantic mackerel, we can guess pretty confidently that this is the Atlantic Ocean. Quick divergence, there's absolutely no way you're gonna find a long fin tilapia in the frickin' Atlantic Ocean. They are freshwater fish. And before you try and argue that this is some near-Earth substitute and not the real Earth, there's plenty of mention of real-life places throughout the world. Like the cruise ship focuses on Sweden, and Caravan Town mentions both Jakarta and the Niger region. So this is definitely set in our version of Earth, just with some changes. A little bit ago, Insider released this very helpful visualization of what Earth would look like if all of the ice melted, and here we can see what the Caribbean would look like. It's decently similar to what we find in the game, a constellation of dispersed tropical islands in a warm ocean. Although there's also those still major land masses right next to them, so the whole necessity of floating cities and all that fun stuff really isn't truly a necessity there's still plenty of land left for people to inhabit. The Earth hasn't sunk in the way that the continents as we now know them ceased to exist and our planet went from like 70% water to 99% water. Most major cities will be completely unharmed. Of course, Florida is mostly gone, but then again, does that really bother anyone? So that's the first bit of this that falls apart logically. Except remember that part where I said that all of the glaciers melted and that's the reason why the sea level rose so much? There is something about that that makes even less sense. The devs have confirmed that in the highly anticipated Chapter 3, one of the new story locations is one of the poles. You see all this white and blue stuff? I don't know about you, but I'm relatively willing to bet that that's snow and ice. So we haven't even hit the point where all of the ice has melted, meaning that the sea level wouldn't have risen that much even to that point yet. Assuming that the polar biome works in the same way that the other biomes in the game work, where you could find other small islands of the same biome nearby the story location, that means that there's still a relatively significant amount of snow and ice that's unmelted, meaning again, we're not going to get to that first point of major ocean lies. So that covers my first point of the fact that the sea level just flat out wouldn't rise that much, but there's also some more facets to why that's unusual. 
The third story location, Balboa Island, is canonically a former mountaintop. Now, for a moment, let's just suspend our disbelief over the whole part about the oceans not rising this high, and just say that they did. Balboa Island is covered in subboreal flora and fauna with plenty of evergreens, birch trees, and bears wandering around. Now, this is perfectly reasonable for a decently tall mountain. It's not going to be anything like the big spiky Himalayas, but more like a typical mountain, kind of like the ones you find in the Pacific Northwest of North America. Again, we're going to suspend our disbelief for a little more that you would find this within two kilometers of other islands which are all tropical. But frankly, a whole 40 meters of extra elevation isn't nearly enough to maintain a tropical to boreal ecotone. Ecotones are basically the semi-imaginary lines we draw in between types of ecosystems. They can either be distinct ecotones, like the aquatic to surrounding forest, or a little more gentle, like the way a forest transitions into a prairie through an oak savanna. But given that these systems existed well before the ocean started swelling, something we'll get into a little more in a little bit, the main environmental factors that separate these temperate pines to the tropical pine trees are photo period and temperature, so light level and heat. And as you might guess, the tropics have a little more light and a little more heat than you typically find on top of a mountain in a moral, temperate region. Basically, there is absolutely no shot that either of these ecosystems would exist at a similar elevation in relatively close proximity. The desert islands around Caravan Town are a little bit different since you can have desert mountains, and some of them happen to be in tropical regions or subtropical regions, so we'll forgive that bit. But this evergreen forest is just flat out impossible in a tropical region. Why do I know this? Because it's literally part of my research that I've done. But remember that bit where I mentioned about these ecosystems needing to exist in the first place if we're gonna assume that Balboa is a remnant island? That means that there's a tropical mountaintop somewhere in the world that are just shy of a subboreal ecotone. Yeah, mountains topped with the occasional palm tree and pineapples and other tropical bushes make a whole lot of sense in comparison to a literal pine forest that's just about 40 meters taller. There's also plenty of issues with Balboa itself. We know that Raft has to be set in a decently near future version of our planet because they're still printing and distributing physical newspapers, which are already rapidly going out of style. So it's not exactly a major surprise that there are still bears here, and I actually appreciate the fact that there aren't too many of them. Because there is absolutely not enough food for these bears to survive, let alone the genetic bottlenecking that comes with such a small population. The 14 or so berry bushes that you come across are in no way enough food for five bears, and we never see them near the shore, so we can assume that they don't know how to fish in the ocean. I take more issue with the fact that these bears look decently healthy given the lack of food availability, and that they magically never eat this guy. But we haven't even talked about my issues with the ocean itself yet. I briefly mentioned the longfan tilapia as a fish that absolutely does not belong in the ocean as a freshwater fish, but that's just the beginning of my issues with the ocean. First off, there is absolutely no way that these coral reefs would magically make their way up a new mountaintop habitat in the same window of time where our bear friends from Balboa would still be alive. Unless someone was going around running their own restoration of every single island you come across, but that seems even more unlikely. We have a few kinds of tube coral and shelf coral, which individually would grow anywhere between half an inch to eight inches in a given year, so I don't really have major problems with how big they are. Just in the small detail that it takes between 100 to 300 thousand years to establish a new coral reef. So if you've heard scientists panicking about corals going away, that's kind of a huge part as to why. And like we talk about with the bears, there's no shot that it's been within that period of time to raise up these corals to raise up at least a few hundred meters in elevation. If it had been that long, the conifer trees we find on Balboa simply would not exist. Also, the newspapers would be long gone. Those temperate trees, like the birch trees and the pine trees, if given a hundred thousand years, would have major difficulties maintaining their population in a freshly tropical environment. So the coral reefs obviously don't belong in that time frame, but they're here, so let's talk about the stuff that's wrong with them as they exist. 
First up, I don't know of any tall seaweeds that grow in such close proximity to coral reefs. Kelp strands are actually a kind of algae that just work together to make one big plant-like thing, and they tend to be found in significantly colder waters. The seagrass beds, actually native to the Caribbean, which is where we are, remember, are real plants in the fact that they establish root structures and all of that fun stuff. The tallest ones I've been around personally weren't taller than two feet. Nothing like these tall guys we find scattered around the islands. They also have an interesting branching pattern that seems a lot more similar to the kinds of seaweed I tend to find in tidal environments, so that's just a fun detail. Another issue I have with the reefs is the lack of life around them. Coral reefs are one of the most quintessential examples of biodiversity and biodensity on the planet. They harbor so many species and are always booming with life. Maybe I'm a bit biased as an invertebrate specialist, but there's none of the smaller animals around that make a coral reef work. We can't find any sea stars, crabs, or even schools of fish that everyone pictures when you think of a reef. There are a few small things around these reefs, but the main thing you're likely to encounter is the poison puffer, specifically around large islands with larger reefs. Now, pufferfish are very real and very much exist, but contrary to what this game would have you believe, they don't explode when you inconvenience them. They puff into funky little balls and I love that for them. They also don't leave clouds of noxious or toxic residue behind them. Again, a slight suspension of disbelief for them, but regardless of the whole splodin thing, it seems like a really poor evolutionary decision. You can't make babies when you're dead, so there's definitely not going to be enough of these guys around if everyone left on the planet is diving for resources the same way we are. Shockingly, I don't have anything wrong with the so-called marine life events that happen in the game. Humpback whales, bottlenose dolphins, moon jellies, and green sea turtles are all perfectly reasonable animals to encounter in the Caribbean Ocean, and the sea level rise likely wouldn't affect them too drastically. It would be a bit weird to find these stingrays in completely open ocean, but that's something I'm willing to let slide. My main issue with the open water is with the shark. Again, if you're familiar with my content, the shark's name is Jeremiah. In game, they're named Bruce. There's absolutely nothing wrong with finding a great white-esque shark in tropical waters. They're migratory sharks and can be found in plenty of warmer waters, so that's not surprising. But as a quick disclaimer before we talk about the real science aspect of why the shark bothers me, I just want to address the fact that sharks are not bloodthirsty monsters looking to eat you. It always bothers me when ocean-based games use sharks as a primary villain, because frankly, they're just not. By far and large, shark attacks can be attributed to simple accident. Great whites are ambush predators, meaning they attack from below, swimming rapidly at the surface to attack what they believe is prey. And frankly, a human on a surfboard looks remarkably similar to a very tasty seal. And sharks are also naturally curious creatures, and often just looking to do the same thing that a teething toddler does. They bite on things that they're not supposed to. Shark attacks are also very rare and few and far between. You're actually more likely to be killed by a cow or even a vending machine than you are to be attacked by a shark. There's never actually been a true quote-unquote rogue shark that specifically goes after humans. Again, it's just a terrible accident. So Jeremiah is an exception, and definitely not the rule, and sharks are not to be hated, they're not monsters. But back to talking about why the shark in Raft is weird. First up, Jeremiah is a pretty small great white. Great whites are typically 4-ish to 6-ish meters in length, and Jeremiah is barely 2-3 to three meters long. Now, we could chalk that up to being a juvenile shark or a younger individual. The problem with that is all of the scars surrounding Jeremiah. Sharks do scar, and scientists even use those scars to identify individual sharks for their studies. Jeremiah has quite a lot of them, and many are well healed. Of course, healing takes time, and building up that many scars takes time. So I'm less willing to believe that Jeremiah is just a baby. Second is the fact that Jeremiah is likely a female shark due to the lack of claspers on her ventral side. Claspers are basically the shark equivalent of male genitalia, and Jeremiah just doesn't have them, meaning she's almost certainly female. That 4-6 to six meter size range I mentioned earlier encompasses both male and female sharks, 
and in great whites, females are actually larger than males by a pretty substantial margin, being mostly between 15 to 16 feet long. So that puts even more emphasis on the idea that she would have to be young in that size range, but again, the scarring disputes that. And we know that it's not going to be due to a lack of food availability due to all of those fish, dolphins, and whales we talked about earlier. Also, sharks don't eat people, so there's that too. That's the more academic version of why the science of wrath doesn't make sense. But I'd be remiss in my duties if I didn't mention that you can build a raft that looks like this, and it still manages to stay upright regardless of how many things you bump into or how big the waves get. Even the Titanic couldn't do that. But I figured physics is clearly less interesting than marine biology, so here we are. Anyways, that does it for this analysis of raft scientific integrity. Again, please don't take this as a serious criticism of the game or blame the devs for any of this information. Raft is a wonderful game that requires a suspension of disbelief, as all great games do. All in all, I think they did a fantastic job of extrapolating the extremes of what our world would look like if we got to this point, which I am seriously hoping we don't. And I love any game that focuses on the ocean, so I'll always love Raft regardless of its scientific flaws. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. I'm always happy to ramble about science, it's kind of why I'm a scientist. Let me know if there's anything else that you thought I should have covered in this video, or if you think my analysis is way off base. I welcome any and all feedback. But I hope you enjoyed! Please consider leaving a like if you did, and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And as always, have a great day.